Your privacy concerns today are not what they may be in the future. I think it comes out of the privacy concerns because it's very much relevant what it takes to stay anonymous and whether that is actually a viable thing. It is reasonably possible to have some degree of anonymity if you're, if you're pretty careful about it, but it is, it, it is a very challenging problem. Welcome to Office Hours. I'm part of the cybersecurity group here at Tandent. I do research on privacy and security as well as how it relates to AI and how it relates to sort of human-centered computing and human behavior. Increasing amounts of our lives are sort of electronically mediated. So much of our daily human interactions has sort of a, a digital component. As a result, like there are third parties that have unprecedented sort of windows into our individual lives. And I think this is having a really profound effect on our society in terms of privacy and autonomy and sort of what it means to connect with other people and so on. And I think it's important to retain some of that privacy and autonomy to understand where it's changing and how. Now, people have a pretty good idea of what we mean by privacy in the physical world. People understand doors, but there's a lot of misunderstanding to some extent on who sees what, who knows what in a digital world. Also, the harms of privacy can be kind of diffuse and in the future, as opposed to some of the benefits of or participating in certain types of online life are kind of immediate, which makes it hard for humans to reason about. People thought an electronically mediated society could actually be more private to some extent than not, because you wouldn't necessarily have to see people face to face to do interactions, right? There's the, the old saying from like the 1990s of on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. But really, there's a large profile of all of your history and, and, and interactions and things like that. So it's, it's not quite true. And there were a lot of cryptographic techniques and still are to do a lot of the things that we think you need to sort of have a person in the middle of the interaction for privately but people don't either don't know about them or they're not sort of as maturely developed as other ones or they're not used. A lot of my initial question was sort of, well, why not? Why is it that we're not investing in these things? And that's where some of these social and economic and risk assessment factors came in. So where my research becomes sort of very interdisciplinary very quickly. There's a number of projects that I've been working on right now. A lot of them relate to like sort of what happens when people try and use privacy enhancing technologies and to understand how the internet responds to that. So if you use privacy preserving extension for your browser, for example, how does it break the websites that you might go to, either intentionally or unintentionally? How do you get treated differently because you're blocking JavaScript or you're blocking ads or you're doing various things like this? Also related to that, sometimes people will use anonymous communication proxies like the Tor browser and want to do things like edit Wikipedia, which is blocked by Wikipedia, but has historically been imperfectly blocked. So the question is like, what are those people doing on Wikipedia? Is it different than what people who are just edit without using anonymous technologies do? And how would it be different? Are they valuable contributions? Are they harmful contributions? What we've mostly found is that they're very comparable to sort of new and inexperienced contributions from other users, but with more focus on on sort of somewhat more controversial topics. It's an interesting area that we've been we've been looking at. The other thing I've been interested in is the privacy needs of sort of specific populations. So one of the things we've been looking at is what kind of concerns parents have had over online education for K through eight children who are using technology and other types of classroom technologies initially during COVID, but almost all of these technologies are still in use in the classroom, especially in New York when we've gotten rid of snow days. And so we're now having you know, video days and to understand the kinds of concerns that creep up in that area, the type of concerns patrons of public libraries might have with privacy. We've also been really interested in studying how people protect their privacy in the context of when they're worried about stalking and harassment. So I've done some work to understand kind of intimate partner surveillance and some of these issues that can come up and how people conceive of these things and learn about and 
become involved in basically spying on their intimate partners. We've also looked at when people are harassed online, how can we detect sort of when the network is being called to harass someone and what happens when someone tries to sort of remove parts of their internet presence. So understanding uh, opting out of like some, some people search and data broker websites and what happens and how that relates to some of the regulations in Europe and in California and in other places. And to what degree does this work? Is it usable? What kinds of problems do people run into when they try and do these things? And we have a couple of projects. One was looking at the deepfake creation community. So trying to understand forums where people discuss and ask questions about deepfakes. So what do they talk about? How do they conceive about the ethics of deepfakes? And what do they come to these forums, which often sell non-consensual pornographic deepfakes of public figures. A lot of people are coming there to ask kind of technical questions to learn how to use the software. And then we have another side of it where we're actually looking at the deepfake detection tools out there and trying to understand how well they work and if they can be sort of circumvented or attacked and how, how hard that is. So kind of doing a survey of a lot of these things that are out there and trying to, to understand from a technical perspective. So one of the things I'm actually most well known for is studying how well you can identify someone. So it's kind of the flip side of, of privacy from their writing style or their computer coding style. So using machine learning to evaluate sort of whether this piece of writing is from one person or another person, or is it the same as this other person? Right now we're actually looking at the impact of large language models in this space. So understanding how you could detect code generated by cogeneration models or language models compared to humans. It's almost kind of more of an attack on privacy in some respects to understand the limit. I think it comes out of the privacy concerns because it's very much relevant to what it takes to stay anonymous and whether that is actually a viable thing. It is reasonably possible to have some degree of anonymity if you're, if you're pretty careful about it, but it is, it is a very challenging problem doing things like keeping your software up to date and using a good password manager to have good passwords that aren't being reused and stuff like that is very helpful. Being really mindful about your internet presence, being aware of these, these different effects in the privacy settings that you have and the fact that your privacy concerns today are not what they may be in the future.